Ladies and gentlemen, it is my distinct pleasure to turn the podium over to General Hugh Shelton. Well, thank you very much for that very kind introduction. It really is a distinct honor to be, to be introduced by a warrior like yourself and a, an individual who's doing such a magnificent job here at, uh, with the uh, ROTC program, which I hold near and dear to my heart. I'd like to welcome you also, uh, as well as uh, the, our colleagues from Duke. Where are the Duke ROTC group sitting? Got any? Well, don't tell me we got no-shows. Okay, we'll take care of that. But it is, it's great to be back here in Wolfpack country, needless to say, here in Raleigh. It's always a pleasure to come back. It's a distinct honor and privilege to speak to the, honors, to the uh, university honors program to, uh, students today, or the scholars. I know I've had the chance to meet several of you individually, and I know that we've got an awesome amount of talent in this room today. Matthew Zulick, the CEO, the, uh, now the chairman of the board, former CEO of Red Hat, right over here on the Centennial campus, uh, was over to speak not long ago in the business school, and he told me, he said, boy, they've got some smart people there. I said, tell me about it. I've actually had some of them in my home, and it was so smart it made my head hurt. But you know, that wasn't the case with Albert Einstein. I'm told Albert Einstein used to like to visit in the RTP area. In fact, I heard a story the other day about how he came to visit and stopped by a local tavern one afternoon and was having a... Uh, a beer, when all of a sudden the individual on his right said, you know, Dr. Einstein, I've got an IQ of 180. Einstein said, that's magnificent. Perhaps later in the evening we can discuss my theory of relativity. <laughs> all of a sudden the guy on the left said, Dr. Einstein, you know, I've got an IQ of 150. Einstein thought for a second. He said, great. Later in the evening, maybe we can discuss the continuum of light. A few minutes go by, and down on the far end of the bar, a guy looks up and hollows out, Hey, Einstein, I've got an IQ of 50. Dr. Einstein takes a sip of beer, turns, looks at me, and says, How about them Tar Heels? <laughs> I had another one for Duke, but since they're not here, I won't tell that one. <laughs> it's great to have the opportunity to speak to you today, and especially to talk about leadership. Now, as was mentioned a while ago, I normally like to talk about values-based leadership because between you and I, I really do believe that that's at the crux of what's wrong with this country today. That's what's gotten us in deep trouble in the last several years. We see it in the headlines every day. We see it in almost every realm that you look at, whether it's on Wall Street, whether it's in, in some cases, the universities, even the armed forces occasionally has an issue with that, but values-based leadership. But today, I've been asked by, your organi by the organizers of the event to talk about transitional leadership, how leadership transitions in Washington, and by that I mean inside the beltway. What takes place when you have the change in power as we have just witnessed? And you know, in the last couple of weeks, three weeks, we have witnessed one of the greatest things about this country of ours, one of the greatest things about democracy, and that has been the smooth and easy transition from one administration to the other. In this case, from Republicans to Democrats. Before that, it was Democrats to Republicans. But we've been fortunate in that since we've had our Constitution, we've never had a coup, an attempted coup, a revolution, or whatever, that is so common in so many other countries around the world. And I've had the opportunity to visit about 115 of those countries, 109 of them while I was a chairman. So I've had a chance to see them, and I've been, in some cases, in the middle of fracases, if you will, fights that were all, that were all wrapped around the transition of leadership. The reason we went into Haiti was because Aristide had been overthrown by, an, by it was supposed to be a democratic government. They threw him out. So we went back in to reinstate the democratically elected government. I was there in Washington when we transitioned from President Clinton over to President Bush. And let me tell you, one of the first things that I did, right after the, uh, the oath of office had been administered, I'd gone back to the Pentagon, well, after the parade, I finally got back to the Pentagon. 
And uh, a short while later, the uh, Secretary of Defense, at that time, Donald Rums Rumsfeld, came back to his office. And I went to his office, which was on the floor just above mine, and I said, Mr. Secretary, I'm here to tell you today that when the oath of office took place, when President Bush was sworn in, the allegiance of the entire United States Armed Forces automatically switched from Clinton to Bush. And I want you to know that I'd like to be considered one of the first members of your team and not a holdover from the last team because that's the way it works in America. And I said that to him because, you know, there are those, there are a lot of people, there's a lot of chatter out there. There are blogs, there are people that write in magazines that talk about the importance of civilian control of the military, which I think is 100% on the target. But every now and then, there's an article that talks about, well, the military may be getting out of control, and we really got to watch these guys in uniform. And nothing, in my opinion, could be further from the truth. We all recognize who our, who our masters are, if you will, and that's whoever the, our elected officials are. And so I felt it was necessary to do that because otherwise there may be some lingering thread in his mind about whether or not I was really on his team or still just on the other, other guy's teams. And I wanted to make sure there was no question about it. So some of the questions I'd like to, I was asked to address today. Who is it? Who is the chairman? Who are the other members of the Joint Chiefs of Staff? What's their relationship to the president? How do you, how do you uh, show what your, how do you get your recommendations on policy or on operations up to the president? What does a new president and his team do to try to ensure continuity of military leadership and, and while placing their own team in place? And what are the challenges that the new president and his principal advisors will face? Well, let me start off with who is the chairman of the Joint Chiefs? And I think it's necessary that we understand how that process takes place. As, as was said, he's the number one guy in the military, which arguably makes him the most powerful military guy in the world. Since most of the other countries around the world still look to America for guidance, they look to America to see what, how we're going to go about doing our business or whatever. I can tell you in walking into a NATO meeting as the chairman, all other members, and there were, not, there were another 18 of them at the time, all 18 individuals wanted to know what America's position was going to be on whatever the issue was at hand. And most of the time, we could, con we could convince them to move in the direction that we wanted them to go. And so the chairman, by law, is the principal advisor, principal advisor to the Secretary of Defense, to the National Security Council, and to the President. That's his job, and it's, it's in law. The chairman is selected by the president, but he normally is, is based on the recommendation of two people, the Secretary of Defense and the National Security Advisor. They make a recommendation to the president. The president will then conduct an interview. He'll bring that individual in. My interview with the president was supposed to take 20 minutes. An hour and 30 minutes later, People had gathered around the little keyhole there in the, uh, into the Oval Office and were peering in to see what was going on inside the room. Well, it was simply a, a very detailed conversation taking place between the President and myself because he had a lot of questions that he wanted to know where I came out and what kind of recommendations he would be getting from me if certain things were to take place. Well, I went into that interview not really wanting the job. I don't know if you believe that or not, but it's the truth. I was the head of Special Operations Command. I was with the SEALs and the Green Berets and, you know, the great Air Force combat control. I didn't care if I went to Washington or not. I knew what the job entailed. I'd worked there before. And I'm going to give that up for jumping out of airplanes at 24,000 feet and having the time of my life. I really didn't want to. But out of a sense of, of duty, if you will, a sense of service, when the Secretary of Defense asks you to come and serve, you feel at least obligated to go up and go through the process, and so I was doing that. So finally he got to the one question, and I saw a chance to, to hit, the, hit the ball out of the park. He said, if we were to determine who, who had uh, blown up Cobar Towers, killing or severely injuring 219 U.S. airmen in the process, what would your recommendation be? And I said, well, Mr. President, I'm assuming that you mean that we found there is a nation state that has either been harboring or been responsible for the attack. He said, yes. I said, then I think our, our, uh, our plan ought to be to make them pay back by about 100 to 1,000 times what they did to us. 
It's a policy that's worked very well for America in, in the past. It's called deterrence. You know, gotta know that if you're going to, to uh, screw with the Falcon, you better know how to fly. And they, they have really messed with us and we need to pay them back. He paused for a second. He said, okay, fine. And he went right on to the next question. I thought, well, he either liked it or I blew it. I won't get the job. So I finished up that thing after about an hour and a half of questions very similar to that. And I went back to National Security Advisor and as I walked in, he looked up at me and he said, did you get the job? And I said, I don't know, you'll have to ask the president. And about that time, the phone rang, the red phone next to his desk and he, yes sir, yes sir, three bags full, and put the phone down, he said, you got the job. A mixed blessing. But uh, it's one of those things that I did out of a sense, as I said, of service. So that's, the, uh, that's what you get into. Now often I'm asked, does the chairman have to be a service academy graduate? And I've always found that to be a, not a dumb question, but a strange question since I'm an ROTC graduate from this great university. And so the answer is, up until General Peter Pace, the first Marine to be the, uh, to be the chairman about uh, four years ago now, up until Pete took the job, the previous 24 years had all been an ROTC or a direct commission uh, guy that was the chairman. The one direct commission was General John Vesey who was commissioned on the, on the, uh, on the uh, battlefield at Omaha Beach at Normandy. But the rest of us were all ROTC graduates, so the answer is no. And we may have, sitting in this room today, right here in front of me, a future chairman of the Joint Chiefs. The opportunity is there. And so that was, that's always an easy question. Communications, how do you communicate with the, with the uh, president, with the chairman, I mean, with the uh, secretary, and with the National Security Council? Well, with the Secretary of Defense, the chairman normally meets, the secretary, as I said, is on the office right upstairs. So about every morning, you have a meeting with the chairman. It normally will be the chairman, the Secretary of Defense, the deputy secretary, and the vice chairman. We'll all meet, four of you, around the table there in the secretary's office. And you talk about the hot issues for the day, thing, things, information that you need to get to the secretary fairly quickly. Now, it could, it, could come that you, it could happen that you meet more than once a day. It could be two to three times a day if something really hot's going on. And of course, you're with him on other briefings and things of that type, but you have a very close relationship with the Secretary of Defense. When you travel, you are tra traveling with a communications team that keeps you in constant contact with the Secretary and with the President. That team is, uh, whether you're in the airplane while you're flying, you can talk to him, or if you're on the ground as I was in Namibia, in the, uh, in the back uh, de uh, de deserts and jungle area, both of Namibia, when I got the call that I was to be interviewed to be the chairman, that's where I was, but I had a team with me at the time, for, in this case with special ops that allowed me to talk to any place in the world. And so the chairman always has to have that. When I would leave Washington and go to Emerald Isle to, uh, on vacation in the summer in a cottage just down from where I myself, my family, my brothers and sisters were staying, there was a, a, a communications team that was set up and they had a house filled with communications gear that uh, provided everything you can imagine in terms of keeping me in contact. So that is how you stay in contact. Now with the president, you normally would meet with the president at the National Security Council. Although there may be occasions, like when you're involved in a conflict, as we are today, Afghanistan, Iraq, where the chairman is over at the, in the Oval Office daily. If you've got a real hot action going on, he may be over there two or three times a day. You spend an awful lot of time making that trip between the, from the Pentagon across the Potomac over to the White House. But, uh, but it keeps you in close contact, and it keeps you involved with all the nitty gritty so, not, so that the president is able to, to influence whatever action you need for him to influence. Now with the National Security Council, you can meet with them once again, on average probably about once a week. If there's a crisis going on, it may be seven times a week as it was a lot of time during my time in office. Let me talk a little bit about that National Security Council. National Security Council consists of the President, the Vice President, the Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense, Secretary of the Treasury, and the National Security Advisor. That's who by law consists, the National Security Council consists of. But the law goes on to say that the principal military advisor will be the chairman. So the chairman is always present when they meet, 
and it says the National Intelligence Advisor will be now the National Intelligence, uh, the head of, chief of the National Intelligence uh, Office. It used to be the director of the CIA until that was in, uh, changed. Some others, though, that may sit in there. You may have the chief of staff to the president that will sit in. If the president's not going to be there in particular, he'll sit in just so he can keep, make sure that the president stays up to speed and that he can advise the president on certain issues as well. That was, uh, that was Erskine Bowles, now the president of the, uh, of the university, when I was the chairman initially, and then later on Andy Card with, uh, with President Bush. But uh, two individuals that served the president very, very well. Erskine Bowles was a, was a real treasure to have in Washington. I can tell you that. He was absolutely superb. You also can have the, uh, the, the general counsel to the president. More often than not, the general counsel will sit there on the back row. He's in there to listen to what's going on. So he can advise the president if the president is getting recommendations that may be bordering on legal or illegal or whatever, but to give him a legal opinion about what the recommendation consists of. And then you have the, uh, ec the uh, advisor on economic policy to the president. You sometimes have the attorney general and the director of the FBI that will sit in. Both of those were present on the day after 9-11 as we met to decide what we were going to do about Al-Qaeda and the Taliban. Both of those individuals were present. And then you can have the director of office of management budget if they want one of the big issues about budget and about what, how many more trillions of dollars we want to carry the national debt. He probably will be sitting back so he can try to prepare a case either to support it or try to tell the president can't do it that well. But in essence, this is the president's principal forum for discussing national security or foreign policy issues. Those are his senior members, and they will shake and frame. Now, we didn't walk in there cold because, as I said, we meet about once a week, sometimes seven days a week. But almost all the ways before the National Security Council meets, one level down from the principals, the deputies, if you will, they will meet to try to frame the issue and to give the staff of all the principals time to work the issues so that they, when I walked in, I knew what the joint staff's recommendation was to me. And, and I knew where that would fit into where the State Department might be coming from or where uh, the Director of Central Intelligence or now the International Intelligence might be coming from. So there is a lot of coordination. Needless to say, that all those meetings leads to coordination. And in Washington, that is so important that everyone's on the same sheet of music and, and the president then can keep the team moving in the same direction. So that's what that's all about. Now let me turn for just a minute to the Joint Chiefs and dissect them a little bit. The chairman, of course, is the number one guy. Below him, you have a vice chairman, and then you have the four service chiefs, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines. In a time of war, we normally would call in the Coast Guard because they play a key role in many cases. So you ask the, the uh, chief of the Coast Guard to come in, but day in and day out, he operates under the Department of Homeland Security. So the, the chairman is elected to a two-year term, nominated again by the president, confirmed by the Senate Armed Service Com uh, Services Committee after a confirmation hearing, as you see on television a lot. And, but for two years, why? Well, the Congress wanted to make sure that when the, chairman, when the chairman's put in, that if they find that they've got a chairman that they think is not presenting proper recommendations or presenting good recommendations or is a yes man or that they detect something's not going well because of the chair, they wanted the capability to take him out in two years rather than wait for four. The chiefs of the services go in for a four-year term. They go through the same confirmation process they are, they are recommended or nominated by the Secretary of their service, Army, Navy, Air Force, or, but then it goes right through, I went up to the SecDef and then over to the, uh, to the White House and then into Congress. Again, Senate confirmation, Senate Armed Services Committee, they confirm, but again, when they're confirmed, they're in for a four-year tour. Now, how do you work continuity of government when you change administrations? Well, as you can see, I think it's built in. The four service chiefs, they don't turn over when the president does. Their four years are, are spread out. You know, two of them may go out this year, another one next year, and one the following year. So it may be over a three-year period after the president comes in before all of those chiefs have rotated out. 
The vice chairman is the same way. He's on a two-year and two-year, like the chairman is, but it's not necessarily in, in cycle. For example, uh, it may be this year that the chairman comes up for, for, for a uh, replacement, but it may be next year or even the year after before the vice chairman would be eligible again. And so you get an automatic continuity that goes on. With the chairman, the president is stuck with whoever is in there at the time he comes in until that individual's two years or four years, as the case may be, is up. For example, I was under President Clinton for my first two years. They convinced me I really need to stay for the next two years, so I stayed. And that meant that after I'd been in, I had reached my three years and four month mark, we changed presidents. So I was under President Clinton for three years and four months, and then President Bush had me for eight months. Then my four years were up, it was time for me to move on, and Dick Myers, my deputy, my vice chairman at the time, moved up to become the chairman. Now, that's, that's how it works, and that's how you in, make sure that the military, while subordinate to the, to the uh, political leaders, are not beholding to the political leaders. The chairman not, is not in there necessarily because he was the favorite son of the current president. He's in there because Congress felt like this was the right person based on a president's recommendation. And so it gives you more balance than, than a lot of people realize. You all don't change over at the same time. In 1986, Congress enacted uh, Goldwater Nichols. That was the first major change in the way that the, uh, the armed forces were organized uh, since 19, the 1947 Security Act after World War II. And the reason that uh, to understand why the, the uh, military leadership operates the way it does today, you have to really take a, a brief look at history. And that history basically can start, can start back at a time when things were not going really well in the armed forces, but no one was doing anything about it. For example, the, uh, the, we had had operations, for example, in Grenada. I mean, in, uh, in, desert, in the middle of the desert at Tehran, in which, as you remember, Desert Storm took, I meant, uh, Desert One took place in 1975. We had a terrible incident that took place in the desert. We had forces that weren't trained. They weren't communicating with each other very well. We had forces that turned around and went back because they didn't have the right equipment. And so it was, in military parlance, a debacle in the desert. Still, Congress did not do anything about that at all. Many suggested that we needed a law that would cause everyone to start working together more closely than they had in the past. We call that jointness, where all the services work together, but nothing was done to, to make that happen. The chairman's role during that period of time had been very, very limited and had been that way throughout Viet the Vietnam era. The way it had worked prior to Goldwater Nichols was the chairman did not have a vice chairman. It was the chairman and four other service chiefs that made up the joint chiefs. So a total of five then, not six. And so the chairman, in order to go to the president and make a recommendation, had to get the approval of the other members of the joint chiefs. And if he didn't get the approval so that he could speak unanimously on behalf of the joint chiefs, then he went to the president with a bunch of dissenting opinions, and he was required by law at that time to present those dissenting opinions. And so here sits the poor president getting his military advice, and he say the, the chairman is recommending one thing, but he's also being told the army disagrees and they think this ought to happen, and the uh, navy has said that's not the right answer in their, in their mind, we need to do something else. So you leave all that up to the president to sort out. Well, as I said, that went on during Vietnam, and there was a young major by the name of H.R. Uh, McMasters who was going to Duke University to get his master's degree so he could teach up at Military Academy. And he did, a, he did his thesis on the actions of the Joint Chiefs and literally the Lyndon Baines Johnson administration during Vietnam. And what he found was lying, deception, and deceit was rampant. Uh, they, you know, it, the secretary was withholding information from the joint chief, from the chairman, because he didn't want him to know everything going on. He found out that even among the joint chiefs, there was a lot of disagreement about the way the war should be fought. And consequently, when the chairman would be out of town, 
and one of the service chiefs would go to see the president. The service chief would try to convince the president that he really ought to be do, fighting the Vietnam War the way that service chief wanted him to fight it. In the case of, the, of uh, Curtis LeMay, it was with air power. We're going to bum them into smithereens. You take the, take the leash off the Air Force, and we'll bum them to smithereens, and the war will be over. The Army would go back in two days later and say, Mr. President, the truth is we need a million people on the ground in Vietnam, and if we get that, we can win this thing in, in a couple of weeks. And so the president is wondering what's going on. And as I said, there was a lot of deception and deceit, and that's all chronicled in this book called Dereliction of Duty. It's a great book. I made every one of the Joint Chiefs read that, and even the Secretary of Defense read it. And uh, it's a great outline for how things should not happen. Well, after Desert One debacle, we failed to rescue the Americans there. There was still a lot of interest in, in making the armed forces reorganize, do something to get them better trained and to fighting as a joint team so that we can have the complementary capabilities of all these great, these four great services pulling together and like one team, like the Pittsburgh Steelers, beating up on the Cardinals or whatever. You know, Cardinals were pretty good too. You had two great teams out there, but... On the other hand, it still didn't happen. And so along came the Grenada operation. In Grenada, once again, highly successful. We rescued the students, the ones that were in peril, got every one of them out of there safely. It was a great operation on the, to all appearances. But what you found in, beneath the surface was we still had services that could not communicate with one another. Their equipment was not interoperable, and they didn't have any kind of standard operating procedures so they could work together. Well, there were two guys in, uh, in Congress at the time, uh, Goldwater, Barry Goldwater and, and Senator Nichols, who said, enough is enough. We are going to change the law and make, make them do it if they won't do it themselves. The, uh, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs at that time was an Air Force general by the name of David Jones, a good, good friend of mine. David Jones said, I agree with you totally, we've got to do it. And of course, all the four service chiefs who were afraid they were going to lose power in this process were adamantly opposed to it. They were, I was, I was there during a the period of time as a brigadier when all this was going on. And I mean, it was, it was bad. The, uh, the service chiefs were just adamant that they would not let this happen. Well, they didn't have any choice. Congress enacted Goldwater Nichols and a couple of really smart guys by the name of Sam Nunn out of Georgia and Bill Cohen out of Maine, later Secretary of Defense Cohen that I worked for, said, by the way, we need to fix that debacle in Iraq, I mean in Iran, where we failed to rescue. We need a special operations force that's got it all together. And so they created the Special Operations Command, <laughs> made it a four-star command, gave it its own budget, and gave it the, the ability to recruit ret and retain people in the special operations field. And so out of that one bill, you got all of that. There is no one today that would not say that the armed forces are far, far better off than they were before that. But again, it wasn't physician heal thyself because as, as we'd already proven, we couldn't do it. It took Congress getting involved in it, unfortunately, in order to make it happen. Now I wanna throw in one little advertisement here. I didn't tell you this up front, but I am going to stop early enough to, to allow you to ask questions if you'd like on about any, anything that I touch on today. So if you've got a question you want, write it down. I, I'll get to as many as I can. Okay, now we've got a new president in office. What's happened? Let me tell you what happened. Before President Obama went into office, he was invited over to the White House after he was elected and he was given a lay down on everything that the military is facing today. He was given a lay down on all of our war plans. And I'll mention more about those in a few minutes. He was, he was told about recruiting and retention and, and you know everything that he really would need to know as a president. And I'm sure if it went the way mine went with President Bush when he came into office, you know, it was with great interest and very cordial and everything went very well. But the real burden of that president's office was not on him at the time. You know, he was, he was interested, but not totally committed at this point. But he was given that. So now he can start to formulate in his own mind, given what I've got to, to, work, to uh, work with when I go in office, who do I want to help me? Who am I going to reach out to to pull in to be my, sec my Secretary of Defense or my Secretary of State, et cetera? He was also told what the limits, what the uh, limitations that the Joint Chiefs are facing today, what the risks are that they think is, is most important that, to them, the risks that they have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. 
Probably at this point, he has not been introduced to the 10 combatant commanders yet. That will come probably within the next two or three months. They'll have a conference in Washington, and they'll bring in all those four stars, and uh, President Obama will have a chance to meet the people that are really out in the field and that will be responsible for fighting the wars for him in the field. There will be a myriad of issues that he will be dealt on, he will have to deal with when he comes in. And I'd like to take a moment now to just touch on some of the issues and give you an idea about what a new president is faced with when he walks into office. Bush was faced with very many of these very same issues, and they're still there today. First and foremost, of course, are the two wars we've got going right now in Iraq and Afghanistan. For example, you know, is he going to keep his campaign promise and pull out? And he'll be told what the consequences of trying to come out of there too fast are. He'll be told what the plan is, as is, as is in process right now, or, or on the books today, to, to conduct a withdrawal. And he'll be given the timelines, and he'll be told what the risks are. But th that will, all of this has is, is already been presented to him. So now he's starting to formulate how, how am I, what kind of decisions am I going to make? Am I going to stick with the campaign promise, or am I going to say, okay, Secretary Gates, I want you to do the following and give them some guidance based on what they're telling that could potentially happen if he tries to come out in the, in the short period of time as he's given them. They'll talk about how the transition might work to change over from us to either the, Afghan, the Iraqi forces or in the case of Afghanistan, what needs to go on in Afghanistan. I'll touch on that in just a second. But he'll also be told, I'm sure, you need to be personally and more involved in bringing in more allies. We need allies to help us in this operation, allies that we haven't had, excluding the Brits. Most of them have been liabilities rather than assets. And so he'll be asked to get it more involved and help to reach out to those heads of government and ask them to start contributing more than they have in the past. Who knows, with a change in administration, we may be successful. We weren't with the, on the last attempt. Then with Afghanistan, you know, things there have turned a little bit on us. We started out doing great. We took our eye off the ball, focused on Iraq too much, and now things, the Taliban, the warlords, the 10 of them are still in charge. They've still got control of their areas. Uh, uh, the the uh, drug trafficking has still continued just as heavily as it was from day one. The Taliban is now resurging in, in, uh, in Iraq. And Karzai and his government at the central level have failed to be able to get their arms around the country in the way that it was envisioned when it first started. Now I'll go back to the day of 12 September when the decision was made to conduct the operation or a few days thereafter out at Camp David and say George Tennant, director of the CIA, told the president in no uncertain terms that wresting power away from the 10 warlords would be the greatest challenge that America had faced any time in the last 20 years. So we knew it'd be tough. And uh, all of that was going to uh, have to be done by Karzai's government in, a, in Afghanistan, and it hasn't taken place. So those are some of the issues. How is he going to beef up in Afghanistan if we don't pull down in Iraq? We're already a stretch in the Army and Marine Corps, stretching them very thin. Rotations are way up, time away from families, and all the consequent issues you face when that happens. And so the president now has that on his plate. The Middle East. The chairman, I'm sure, talked at great lengths to him about the Middle East. And the big concern for the military in the Middle East has been very bluntly stated, we all recognize that the key to success in the Middle East is to solve the current ongoing uh, crisis, if you will, or situation between Israel, Hamas, and, and get a peace settlement in the Middle East. If we could do that, most of America's real tough issues would get a lot easier to deal with in that region of the world. So it's worth every ounce of energy that you put into it. Trust me, it would be. It'd be tremendous to get it. Well, it happened in my lifetime, I'd almost be willing to stand here and bet in my life that it would not. It will be a real miracle if that happens, but it is worth pursuing and as for the reasons that I just stated. But one of the real concerns that the chairman will have to deal with as he sits in the National Security Council, the Secretary of State may say things like, well, we need to put a 25,000 person pr permanent security force in, in, the, uh, in the Gaza Strip or in, over there somewhere in accordance with whatever Israel and the other side will agree to. And if we do that, then they will be assured that America will be there to help keep the peace and everybody will be treated, treated equally. 
Well, the, then you have the question is, can we afford another 25,000 person peacekeeping force? We've had one in Korea now since 1951. 25,000 strong, haven't moved, haven't budged. Rotated in and out, but the same force levels have been there. So that's the issue that things that the chairman will have to deal with and the new president is dealing with even as we speak. North Korea, what about North Korea? What do we do there? How do we reach out to North Korea? Can we get a, any kind of a new peace? As I just said, in South Korea, we've got 25,000 of our people there. In Seoul, Korea, there are approximately 250,000 Americans that are, whose lives would be at stake if the North Koreans were to attack. The North Koreans sort of just across the demilitarized zone with about a million man strong. They've got artillery that can range Seoul, Korea, that rolls in and out of caves that's on, uh, that's on railroad tracks. So it's very hard to get to it, even with some of the best bombs we've got. And so it, you know, you don't sleep well at night if you're the chairman and you know that any minute, the, you know, Kim Jong-il could wake up one morning with a toothache and decide he's going to attack South Korea. So you worry about that because if that happens, guess what? The president turns to the Secretary of Defense who turns to the chairman and says, let's, let's roll. Implement war plan XXX, we gotta go. And you've got to respond. And America cannot afford to lose. We never want to commit ourselves to a war that we can't win. So that's what weighs heavily on your plate, on, on the chairman's plate, and will weigh very heavily on, on the, the president's plate. International Criminal Court. You say, how could the, why would the military be concerned about the International Criminal Court? You know, Secretary Cohen and I fought a, a two-man battle for three years and four months to keep President Clinton from signing the International Criminal Court Accords, if you will, because we did not feel that America's men and women in uniform should be, ever be submitted to a criminal court that is political in nature where the judges are political appointees from other countries around the world who are, who are responding to their own government and making judgments in accordance with how the government. Example, one of the judges during the time we fought Kosovo was from Serbia. Now, we were bumming in the Kosovo and we had one of the greatest F-16 pilots that uh, probably has ever flown the airplane. He was in a combat tour, dropping bombs every day, but he was en route to join the elite Thunderbirds as soon as that operation was over. One day, he went in on a bombing run to take out a key bridge that we had assigned to him. The bridge was, a, was hauling troop supplies and, and other things, and, including Serbian troops, back from the Belgrade area down to the front lines. We dropped that, we cut off their supplies because it was a very big river and steep banks on each side, and that was a key bridge. Well, the pilot is up at about 30,000 feet. He releases his smart bomb, television camera in the front of it. It drops through the clouds, through the television camera, on his screen in the cockpit, he picks up the bridge. And he sits there with a toggle switch and he flies that bomb right to the bridge. You know, there were houses on each side of the bridge, but our goal was to hit the bridge, not hit the houses. So the bomb goes down, goes down, the bridge gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and finally at the last second when it's physically impossible for him to cause that bomb to, go, to turn, right out of the right hand side you see the front of the train before the whole screen goes blank. We hit the train. We hadn't mean, meant to hit the train, although in my mind there was nothing wrong with that, except there were some civilians on that, and of course the, that was painted by the, by the Serbs as a war crime. Now can you, and this guy, it tore him up because when he heard that, he did not want to kill what you could call innocent civilians. I don't know how innocent they were. They were riding with Serb soldiers in a war zone down to the front lines. But at any rate, it tore him up. But can you imagine now, three years later, he's over with his family, he's been assigned to Germany, and one night, this, some Serbians or someone comes in, or the, the German police come in and pick him up and whisk him off to The Hague to be tried as a crime, war criminal because the Serbs had declared him as one. I didn't think that we ever wanted to put our men and women in uniform. I wasn't too concerned. President Clinton called me the day before he left office and he said, Hugh, I wanted to tell you, I'm calling you and Bill Cohen to tell you personally that today I made a decision to sign it because I figured that we'll be better off to have our nose under the tent where maybe we can influence the way it will be carried out than we would be to be on the outside with Iran, North Korea, et cetera. I said to the president, I said, Mr. President, you've got a lot of things on your plate. You've got a lot of things you have to consider before you make a decision. 
my recommendation to you today, even after you've told me that, would still be from a military perspective not to sign it, but I understand why you did it. And, and he signed it. I didn't worry too much because as long as we had Jesse Helms in the Senate, I knew we'd never, he'd never get it ratified. And fortunately, there's still, a, there's still a large contingent there in Washington that I don't think we gotta worry about it being ratified. But that's, those are the types of issues you deal in that you wouldn't think. Another one, of course, that we, we dealt with a lot was uh, the right whale. Uh, before the right whale beached himself off of Cape Lookout the other day, how many in here had ever heard of a right whale? Well, we've got a few, probably uh, majoring in, about, in uh, marine sciences or whatever. But the right whale is a specific species of whale, R-I-G-H-T. And one of the things about the right whale is, the scientists that have studied them have found that the sonars on our submarines do something to the guidance system in the right whale. And frequently, if a submarine goes through a, a whatever you call a gathering of, of right whales, a herd is what I call them back on the farm. You go through that, then they go crazy and they beach themselves on occasion. And so there has been a lot of the conservation groups have tried to make for many years, the, the submarines quit using sonar. Well, sonars are critical for two things. Number one is when they're leaving their ports and we want to send them in a direction where no one even using overhead satellites can tell where they're going. Sonar is a critical part of their method of navigation. And secondly, if you don't, you got to train the way you're going to fight, and they train using sonar. And so we've held firm, and so far so good that they're still able to use. And we've tried to reach accords where we can, where we know there are areas that right whales habitat, in, or right whale habitat, we cut it off moving through those areas. But there are other areas that you, it's absolutely critical. So far, so good. The Kyoto Protocol. That sounds like something that's a State Department problem, right? Well, it is. You know, the Kyoto Protocol is the protocol whereby we are trying to keep the North Koreans from manufacturing nuclear weapons. They have that capability. We know that for a fact. But they haven't thus far. But what they have done is about every two years or three years, they start cranking up those projects again. And the reason they do that is very simple. They are, they are a very poor nation. Their people are starving to death. Most of their revenues are going into buying as much new equipment for their military as they can, while the poor people in North Korea starve. starve. Well, Kyoto, it, it, that is a protocol that was reached whereby the, the, uh, Chinese, the uh, Chinese, the Americans, the Japanese, uh, and we've got two or three other partners in this, will provide food stuff, foodstuffs and oil, heating oil, by the, by the tanker load for the, for the uh, North Koreans with a promise from them that if we provide this stuff, they will not continue to try to develop their nuclear weapon capability. In any other area, the FBI would call that extortion, I think. But we're extorted under the Kyoto Protocol, but it is a relatively cheap way to keep from having them, uh, having them to, to uh, carry this out. So, so far, that has been very successful as well. The, uh, the alternate landing field right here in eastern North Carolina. You wouldn't think that would come up to the chairman, but I'll bet you that it has. I haven't asked Mike Mullins, but I'm sure it's crossed his desk already. Navy needs a place to train, but you've got to offset that with the concerns of the citizens of this country. I got involved with that with Vieques Island, an island off of, the, of Puerto Rico. The Navy insisted they had to retain that as a training area. It was the only place that would allow them to pull together naval gunfire, artillery fire, uh, high-performance aircraft fire, and a landing and land a, a ground force all together. Ultimately, I voted against them, and, and the island went back to Vieques. You say, well, you're a turncoat. How could you vote against somebody like that? You, and the answer was very simple. I had my Navy guys on the Joint Staff go back and review how many times the Navy had actually used it for that purpose, and I found out the answer was a big fat zero. The answer was never. They trained their forces out on the West Coast at Camp Pendleton without having an island like that, and they deployed them into battle. And so if you can do it out there, you can do it back here. So I also looked at what promises the Navy had made to the people of Vegas in order to get that training range, and they had violated about 10 or 12, all 10 or 12, whichever it was, promises they had made to the Vegan people. And so I said, enough's enough. We didn't keep our promise. 
we violated what we told them we'd do, we give it back to them, and ultimately the president decided to give it back. And I think that was the right thing to do. And then, of course, the two other big issues that the president's going to have to deal with that the military is very interested in is China and Russia. Let's talk about China for just a second. Right now, we've got a golden opportunity, I think, with the Chinese. Their economy is starting to perk, but it is not perking full speed yet. And so we have a chance to develop a friendship. You know, we are both competing for resources out in the Pacific. Some say the Pacific economy will be more important to the United States in the next 10 years than the European economy has been for the last 30 or 40 years. Whether or not that plays out, we'll have to wait and see. But the Chinese, of course, want the U.S. out of the Pacific. They also, as you probably have read in the papers today, are pouring more and more of their national resources into their armed forces. And a lot of it now is, is going into offensive weapon systems. You might have read just the other day where they now have decided they're going to start equipping their ships with missiles that can take out U.S. ships any time they come within range of that ship. So it is a concern, a real concern. I was over there about six years ago. Largest, uh, largest military operation they had ever shown to, to a, uh, a Westerner, and it was huge. And I walked out of there with a, with a distinct impression. One is they are physically fit and they're well trained, but their equipment is old. They're about 20 years behind the United States. But then as I was on the plane flying back to the U.S., I thought, you know, we've got allies that will sell them their, their technology, that technology that is almost as good as the United States has today. And with the mass they've got, almost may be good enough considering, considering uh, the size of our forces. And so uh, they can close that technology gap very, very fast. And if their economy starts to, to perking the way most people have predicted that it will, uh, once we get through this world recession and the U.S. economy starts on that upward glide slope, then I think we, we can look in a, probably another five to 10 years and have a major competitor. And unless we're careful, unless globalization does it for us, or unless there's a coup or an over, a democracy breaks out in China, we've got something to be concerned about downstream. And so how do you, how do you relay this to the American people? We all like to bring down the size of our armed forces. We like to get them, you know, after every war, we've always reduced them by an enormous amount. And invariably, if we aren't careful, we'll do that again. And then budgets will get very tight because the economy is not doing very well. Technology will start to fall by the wayside. We'll start living with old technology. At the same time, China is going the other way. That is a concern that I think the president will have to deal with, but it will take the chairman to make sure he fully understands the magnitude of what could be in front of us. And then finally, there's Russia. Russia, a great nation. If you visited Russia any time since the Berlin Wall came down, you would know that there are two things true about the Russians. Number one, they still consider themselves to be a superpower mentally. They still consider themselves to be a great nation. And they still feel like that they are on a par with the United States. Unfortunately, since the Berlin Wall came down and they fell on hard times within Russia, we really did not reach out to them in the way that I always felt like for the four years I was chairman. And I tried on a number of occasions but would constantly run into a brick wall, reach out to them to try to help, to try to pull them in, to try to have them come back out of this, this down, this uh, slump that they're in as a friend of the United States. Because if you look at Russia, it's 11 time zones in size. It's got a world of natural resources available to it. And if they ever get their act together economically with an economic system, free enterprise, if you will, they would be awesome and they'd be a real competitor. And again, they're big. And right now, they still distrust America because of the Cold War. And we haven't done nearly as much as we probably could have in order to try to convince them that we can be a friend. So that's something I think, and I, I, I really believe that the Obama administration, uh, now with, with uh, Senator Clinton as a, as a Secretary of State, I think we'll see a move to try to reach out to both China and Russia and start creating more of a dialogue and bring them on board. These are, uh, these are some of the issues that uh, President Obama is going to have to deal with. Uh, I would tell you, President Bush said it best the other day, I think, uh, when President Obama was sworn in the other day, uh, 
every, he was there with all the gala events that were going on. He said, President Bush at his last press conference said, it won't be until he walks back into the Oval Office right after that, that the full weight of the office will rest on his shoulders. You may have seen that last week, not President-elect Obama, but President Obama visited the Pentagon again. And again, to get the same kind of briefings he got before, except this time, the buck stops with him. He'll have to make the decisions. He'll have to take the risk. And that is an awesome responsibility. The chairman should recommend to him, his, give him his best military advice, and I'm convinced Mike Mullins will. It's not that the chairman doesn't know what the diplomatic, political, and economic factors are that may impact on that decision, but that's for the president. That's for his other principal advisors to tell him about. And then the president has to pull all that together and decide what's best. But I would tell you that in my time there that if the chairman gives, talks in military terms what's best for America's men and women in uniform, and it makes good sense, and it doesn't hurt us economically or politically or diplomatically too, too, much, too much, then he's going to go with that recommendation. It's, uh, it, it's been true time and time again through two presidents. There are times when the entire cabinet is going to be in, in agreement in terms of what the right course of action is, and there are times when the chairman, from a military perspective, may be in the cabinet room and be giving a recommendation that is 180 out from what every other member of the cabinet is recommending. And I can tell you from having done that, that's when the big, the sweat, the big beads of sweat start rolling down. It's a lot of pressure involved with that, but you just go in and you stand for what's right, and you, you know you've got two options when you walk out of there. Number one, you can live with the decision that was, was made, or if you feel like it is going to really cost us a lot of lives, brothers, sisters, husbands, fathers, et cetera, that are going to die in the process, then you can resign as, a, as just to say, I'm not going to be a part to it. So you always have that option. But normally, if you make your case, as I did in my case and the president, uh, you know, I, I was fortunate. Uh, I was the dissenting vote, and I won. So I walked out of there feeling pretty good. In fact, I went home and had a big steak that night. So you, that, that doesn't happen very often. But we've got a great system, and I can tell you right now that even though those are tough issues to deal with, we've got a great country. He's got a great country behind him. He's got a great team that he's brought on board with him right now, and I'm confident that he can deal with them, and, uh, and the transition will continue to go just as smoothly as we've seen these first two weeks. So that's how it is, ladies and gentlemen. It's been great having the opportunity to address you. I will stop right here and see what your questions are. Thank you.